So this evening let us uh, discuss the 10th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. This 10th chapter is entitled The Opulence of the Absolute. In the previous chapter, Lord Krishna described pure devotional service in detail and concluded that chapter by telling Arjuna to think of him always. In this chapter, Krishna continues to speak to Arjuna about his specific opulences in this world, knowing which Arjuna can constantly think of Krishna. Because Krishna is the source of the demigods and the sages, the devatas and the sages, they do not know his origin. One who knows Krishna as the unborn, as the beginningless, as the supreme lord of all the worlds, such an undeluded person is freed from all sins. Let's try to understand what Srila Prabhupada explains about this particular verse. Srila Prabhupada says, out of those who are actually trying to understand their spiritual situation, one who can come to the understanding that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Lord, the proprietor of everything, the unborn, such a person is the most successful spiritually realized person. In that stage only when one has fully understood Krishna's supreme position, can one be free completely from all sinful reactions. Now Krishna explains about the different qualities of different living beings. It is said here that whatever be the qualities of different people, be they good or bad, all are created by Krishna. All these qualities are actually found throughout the universe in human society as well as in the society of the Devatas. Krishna mentions some of the qualities here in this chapter like intelligence, knowledge, forgiveness, truthfulness, control of the senses, control of the mind, non-violence, satisfaction, happiness and distress, a birth and death, fear and fearlessness, fame and infamy. Now the initial qualities that I read out, they are all good qualities. Whereas happiness and distress, they are opposite qualities. Birth and death are opposite qualities. So all kinds of qualities, uh, Krishna is the source. One who engages in devotional service to Krishna, such a person develops all good qualities. Now, in the beginning of the creation, Krishna created Brahma. We should know that in the beginning, there were no devatas, there were no human beings. There was nobody except Krishna. So it is Krishna who begins the creation by first of all creating Brahma. And then Brahma creates the Prajapatis. These Prajapatis are those personalities who are responsible for creating the whole population of the universe in different varieties. Thus Krishna is described as the forefather 
of all the forefathers. These are some of the opulences of Krishna. Generally, people know God is great, but they do not know in detail how God is great. Here are the details. If one knows factually how great is God, then naturally such a person surrenders to God, Lord Krishna, and engages in devotional service of Krishna. Therefore, Krishna says, one who knows in truth this glory and power of mine engages in pure devotional service. Of this, there is no doubt. Next, Krishna gives the summary of the entire Bhagavad Gita in just four verses. What are the four verses? First of all, he says, I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who know this perfectly engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. So, Krishna is revealing this most important understanding we should have. He is the ultimate source of everything. In fact, in the <clears throat> Vedanta Sutra, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in all the Vedic literature, this is the same statement which is made about the ultimate source of everyone and everything. It is the Supreme Lord Krishna only. The second verse among the four verses which summarize the whole Gita is The thoughts of my pure devotees dwell in me. Their lives are surrendered to me and they derive great satisfaction and bliss, enlightening one another and conversing about me. Since Krishna described those who are in knowledge of his ultimate supremacy, they perfectly engage in devotional service. Now, what are their characteristics? They are always thinking of Krishna. Their lives are surrendered completely to Krishna. And they are always discussing about Krishna. When we uh, read about the description of the devotees of Krishna in Vrindavan, they always take pleasure in constantly discussing about Krishna. Then in the third verse, of this series of four verses, Krishna says, to those who are constantly devoted and worship me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. So again, this is repeating what was already told in the eighth chapter, that only by pure devotional service can Krishna be attained. So how does it work? To those who engage in Krishna's devotional service with love. Krishna says, he gives the understanding by which they can reach Krishna. So, it is Bhakti Yoga, which is the only yoga system in which, along with the yogi putting his efforts to actually progress in the practice of the yoga, Krishna also helps. That is not true of any other yoga system. All other yoga systems, one has to practice by oneself and there is no specific help given by Krishna. That is because more or less all the other yoga systems, people want to independently do it. Why doesn't Krishna help the others? Because they don't want Krishna's help. Whereas the devotee always depends on Krishna 
and therefore Krishna is more than willing to help the devotee. Finally, in the fourth verse of this series of four verses, giving the summary of the Gita, Krishna says, out of compassion for them, for whom, for those who are devoted and are constantly worshipping him, Krishna says, that he is dwelling in their hearts and as the indweller of such devotees he destroys with the shining lamp of knowledge the darkness which is born of ignorance so krishna personally enlightens such devotees by giving them the required knowledge now after describing these for in these four verses the essence of the Gita Arjuna now declares that he has become completely free from all doubts if we remember in the second chapter we heard how Arjuna telling Krishna I am confused about my duty kindly instruct me so Krishna has been instructing in the second chapter Till now, till the beginning of the 10th chapter, Krishna has been instructing Arjuna. Now, at this stage, Arjuna says that he has become completely free from all doubts. And he further declares, Krishna, you are the supreme personality of Godhead, the ultimate abode, the purest, the absolute truth. You are the eternal transcendental original person the unborn and the greatest now it is not because Krishna is an intimate friend of Arjuna that Arjuna is flattering Krishna by calling him the supreme lord the greatest etc whatever Arjuna says here is confirmed by the original Vedas even the great sages such as Narada, Asita, Devala, Vyasa, all of them confirm this truth about Krishna. Next, Arjuna asks Krishna to tell about Krishna's divine opulences by which he has spread himself in this world. Arjuna says, O oh Krishna, how shall I constantly think of you? In what various forms should I remember you? Now remember that Krishna said in the previous chapter ending, always think of me. Now Arjuna as a devotee of Krishna is asking, how can I think of you? In what various forms should I think of you? Now Srila Prabhupada explains, the common man if at all he has to think of Krishna, he can only think materially. Now Krishna, we should remember, does not have any material form. Krishna's form is completely spiritual. So how will a common man think of Krishna when a common man cannot think of anything spiritual? So Arjuna is asking Krishna, in what various uh, physical forms is Krishna represented in this world so that is Arjuna's specific question so Krishna replies yes I will tell you of my divine opulences in this world but only of those which are very very prominent because Krishna says his opulence is limitless even in this world, Krishna has unlimited opulences. Now Krishna is going to describe that which can be directly perceived by the common man. Now what does Krishna do? Krishna lists some prominent opulences. He lists 82 of them in the remainder of the chapter. Some of which I will mention here, which we can easily understand. Krishna says, of lights, I am the radiant sun, which is the uh, brightest source of light in the entire universe. It is the sun, sun planet. 
So that sun planet, which gives out so much of light and heat, is actually a representation of Krishna only. Among the stars and the moon, there are so many stars shining when we see at night, when we see the sky, we can see so many stars. But among them, the brightest is the moon. And that moon is the representation of Krishna. Of the Devatas, there are so many Devatas. There are 33 crore Devatas. Among all of them, Krishna is represented by Indra, the king of heaven. Of all the Rudras, Krishna says, I am Lord Shiva. Hmm? Rudras are another category of Devatas. There are many of them, millions of them. And among all of them, their chief, Lord Shiva, is representation of Krishna. Of the bodies of water and the ocean, we can easily understand which is the biggest body of water. It is the ocean. So that ocean is a representation of Krishna. Of sacrifices and the chanting of the holy names or japa. Uh, in this age, particular age, this particular instruction of Krishna that he is represented as the chanting of the holy name is very significant. Because even though it is difficult for us to do different types of sacrifices which are recommended in the Vedas, it is very easy to perform this particular type of sacrifice of chanting the holy names. We simply have to vibrate our tongue and produce the sound of the Hare Krishna mantra. We just have to say Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. That's all. This easy way of doing sacrifice is the best sacrifice that we can uh, perform. So Krishna is represented by this topmost of all sacrifices, the sacrifice of chanting the holy name. Then Krishna says, of immovable things and the Himalayas. Himalayas are the greatest range of mountains. So Krishna is represented among different uh, immovable mountains by the Himalayas. Of all trees, I am the banyan tree. As you might be aware, the banyan tree can spread over several hundreds or even thousands of square kilometers. Hmm? So the greatest of all trees, the banyan tree, is a representation of Krishna among all the trees. Of the many hooded snakes, I am Ananta. Uh, there are snakes, two kinds of snakes, snakes with hood and snakes without a hood. So among the many hooded snakes, the greatest is Ananta. Hmm? Ananta has actually got unlimited hoods, but generally Ananta is seen with 1000 hoods. So that greatest of all hooded snakes, Ananta is actually a representation of Krishna. Among the bees, I am the lion. The lion is the most uh, uh, ferocious and is the king of all animals in the jungle. So that lion is a representation of Krishna. Among birds, I am Garuda. Garuda is uh, the greatest among all birds. So Garuda is a representation of Krishna. Among flowing rivers, I am the river Ganga. Now, Ganga is the greatest river. Why? Because this river Ganga, it is flowing not only on the earth planet, it is flowing everywhere in the universe. What is the origin of Ganga? In the Bhagavatam it is described once an incarnation of Krishna by name Vamana. When he had to measure three steps of land, he expanded himself and he stretched one of his legs to pierce the covering, the outer covering of the universe. And the water from outside this universe, which is called the 
spiritual water of the causal ocean that leaked inside and that became the water of the Ganges. So the water of the Ganges as it is coming in it is washing the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord Vamana. So therefore the Ganga river, water of the Ganga river it is spiritually potent. Anybody takes bath in the river Ganga they can become free from all sinful reactions. So that's the greatness of the river Ganga. So that river Ganga is the representation of Krishna among all the rivers. Krishna also says something which is not very pleasant for us to hear. He says, I am all devouring death. Krishna says when he comes his death, especially for the non-devotees, those who don't accept Krishna, he comes his death and what does he do? He takes away everything, all of our wealth, all of our possessions, we are separated from all of our relatives, near and dear ones. Uh, we are to leave this body and go. The body to which we are so much attached, we are to leave and go. They cannot take this body with us. So, therefore, death is the representation of Krishna, especially for the non-devotees. Then Krishna says, of the sages, I am Vyasa. Vyasa is the greatest sage. Vyasa actually put down the Vedas in writing. Before Vyasa put down the Vedas in writing, the Vedas were actually uh, coming down in human society through oral tradition. The Guru would speak and the disciple would simply hear and commit to memory. And then the disciple would teach same Vedas from memory to the next generation of disciples. But at the beginning of this Kali Yuga, foreseeing that people's memory will not be sufficiently uh, big, Vyasadeva, the greatest of all sages, he put down the entire Vedas in writing. So he is the greatest of the sages and he is a representation of Krishna. Like this, Krishna goes on describing many more opulences and he concludes by telling one important opulence that he is the generating seed of all existences. We know everything begins with a seed. So, uh, <coughs> the seed is the beginning of any existence. So Krishna is that generating seed of all existences. So in this way, Krishna has uh, uh, described some of the prominent opulences. Then Krishna says that there is no end to my divine opulences. That he has already told, he is repeating that point that one should not think these are the only opulences of Krishna. No. He has unlimited opulences and all of them are divine. He tells Arjuna, what I have spoken to you is but a mere indication of my limitless opulences. Just to give an idea to Arjuna, what are the kind of opulences Krishna has in this world? Now towards the end of this chapter, Krishna summarizes whatever he has described thus far. He says, know that all opulent, beautiful and glorious creations spring from but a spark of my splendor. What does this mean? Whatever we see in this world that is uh, beautiful, that is uh, glorious, that is opulent, that is splendorous, all these are actually uh, coming from Krishna's own beauty, Krishna's glory, Krishna's splendor, Krishna's opulence. In fact, one of the Upanishads, it is said, it is the Supreme Lord, Krishna, who is the owner of everything in the creation. 
Everything is His. Everything belongs to Him. Whatever we may claim as ours, actually it is something which we have been given by Krishna, by His arrangement. We have got it. We all know we came empty-handed into this world when we took birth. And we are going to also uh, leave this world, we are going to go empty-handed. So what can really be ours? It's only what is given to us by Krishna, by some arrangement. So if Krishna is actually the owner of everything, then devotees understand that everything should be utilized in devotional service to Krishna. That is the proper utilization. Sometimes people think that they have to renounce everything. Spiritual life, one of the important um, factors is renunciation. But um, what can we renounce? Can we renounce something that doesn't belong to us? No, we cannot. So therefore, uh, it is uh, said in the scriptures that real renunciation is recognizing that everything belongs to Krishna, nothing belongs to me, and therefore I should utilize everything, whatever I may have for Krishna's service. So, <clears throat> therefore, um, we should understand if anything is beautiful in this world, that is due to the beauty of Krishna. A small portion of Krishna's beauty is seen in the beauty of different things which are created in this world. In the last verse of this chapter, Krishna concludes by saying, what need is there, Arjuna, for all this detailed knowledge? He says, with a single fragment of myself, I pervade and support the entire universe. What does this mean? This means the Supreme Lord, Krishna, He is represented throughout the entire universe which consists of millions of planets, each planet has millions of living beings. He is represented throughout this universe by his entering into all things as the super soul. Super soul means Krishna is seated in our heart, each one of us. He is seated in our heart as Paramatma. So that Paramatma, Super Soul. Now we distinguish ourself, we are Spirit Soul, each one of us. We are distinctly different from Krishna who is seated in our heart. Krishna is not just Atma, he is Paramatma, Super Soul. In English Prabhupada translates this Paramatma as Super Soul. So, as super soul, Krishna enters into every heart. Now, I am in my heart. I am not in your heart. But Krishna is in my heart, he is in your heart, he is in his heart, he is in her heart. Everybody's heart, Krishna is there. So, Krishna has entered into everybody's heart as Paramatma, super soul. Not only that, he has entered into every atom. You know, this whole world is made up of tiny atoms, material atoms. Each of the atoms Krishna has entered as Paramatma. So it is Krishna only after entering into each and everything that he is sustaining this entire creation. Because after the creation, this whole universe consisting of the different planets and the living beings is maintained by Krishna. He maintains as Paramatma. He is the maintainer. 
he provides for the maintenance of every single living being so therefore krishna is concluding by telling that there is no point in understanding how things exist in their separate opulence and grandeur one should know that all things are existing due to krishna entering them as the super soul which means krishna is entered into the heart of brahma the greatest of all personalities and krishna is also entered into the tiniest of ants and in all of them he has entered and is sustaining as parmatma as a super soul so simply by understanding krishna's representation in this world by his having entered into every atom of every material thing as well as every living being's heart he is uh, represented as the super soul parmatma so that is the uh, end of this chapter hari krishna